Joanna, would you like to go ahead with the Q&A roundtable? Uh, um, so to just jump right in. The first question um, was about when you guys were talking with um, the falling number. So Alex says he uses flower with a falling number of around the 300 mark, but they don't have any issues with volume and structure. What are the critical points when looking at a COA? Oh, so many. Mark, you want to go first? Um, well, with the with a high falling number like that, what might show up on the C, C of A is the extensibility. Um, so you want to look at is is it giving you too much give? Is it is it got too much flow to it? Right. Um, and uh, so it depends a lot on, you I mean, not all millers put everything on the C of A. It depends what you have in, uh, on your typical C of A too, right? Um, but uh, Farino graph um, might give you some of that you know, information um, because it's, it's helping you understand the mixing tolerance. So it'll probably drop off a lot earlier then you might want that might be the, the biggest concern i think yeah i would also um always look at the physical properties of um, the protein and the ash mm -hmm. to me that's always of vital importance if, if those don't change drastically and you're getting you know a higher falling number i wouldn't worry about it if you're still having you know good good volume characteristics. I would just keep an eye on the ash and the protein. That's what I would do. Yeah. All right. Next question. Okay. So this one is with whole wheat bread, um, you will surely have a high falling number around 400 seconds and you will surely need malt to drop it to 200. What um, malt would you recommend with whole wheat bread? Um, that's a pretty high falling number. Thomas, do you any recommendation? Um, with with malts, it's uh, first of all is the flavor profile you're looking for. Right, um, for uh, wheat, wheat flour, whole wheat flour bread. And whole wheat flour bread, um, um, I would I would normally go with with a double malt or a uh, uh, so it adds a little bit of that and uh, uh, or the diastatic. Um, the diastatic definitely helps with a with a whole wheat bread, um, with also water absorption and, and some other characteristics you want. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Um, next one is um, why does my hand kneaded bread loaf taste better than machine kneaded loaves? Because it's got more love. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can give you a better explanation than that. <laughs> uh, most probably because of the process. Um, hand kneaded loaves don't have very good um, process controls, so you probably you know give a little more fermentation there. You little get you know a, a little less stress. Uh, machine kneaded loaves are. Um, are more, are more stressed and usually follows a strict fermentation um, uh, uh, process. So not much, you know, goes wrong there, uh, which is good for quality. Um, but at the same time, I, I think that, um, a, that there is a lot of pushback from the retail artisan bakers in terms of scaling up is because they think that this is a huge issue. But honestly, you can get um, machine kneaded loaves at, at the same um, ar aroma and texture as hand kneaded loaf. Um, if you optimize your fermentation, give it a little longer fermentation and final proof, and also op optimize your hydration levels. And, and make sure you understand, you know, the, the effects that your mixer is having on the dough and don't punish it. Um, don't, don't over mix. I mean, even if you were comparing a household kitchen aid, uh, depending on the size of the mixer that you have, the uh, implements, the, the dough hook that you get is different on the different kitchen aids. And some of them do a lot more damage. They, they're, they need much more aggressively 
the and break the gluten more than others. Um, oddly enough, the the eight quart machine, which is the bigger, more expensive machine, does some of the most gentle mixing. Um, it has a nice spiral pigtail, um, and it works really well because uh, and and you know some people are even using a paddle to try and mix doughs, which will of course shred the gluten apart just like a dough break does in a, in a horizontal mixer, right? Right. Um, Thomas, do you have anything to add on why hand kneaded loaves may taste better than machine loaves? Uh, well, you know, it, it's what you said. It's love, but <laughs> but of course, I can I can uh, uh, definitely add to Mark that, that you know it's uh, uh, he he hit the nail on the head. Mm -hmm. Great, Joanna. Okay, right, so this one is about conveying and in feeding, um, in feeding into hopper and sheeting. Would it be or would it not be less forceful than pumping on portioning? In fitting. Hmm. Mark. Yeah, I would I would say so. I mean it's, by by in feeding, I guess they're they're talking about something that's being pushed into a hopper, right? Um yeah, that's still gonna be less forceful than a dough pump. Yeah. Um absolutely. Right. Um yeah. I agree with that as well. The less, uh, the less uh, pumping and the less vacuuming, if you can like turn off the vacuums, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the better it is. So yeah, I agree. Yeah, there's, there's some with, um, I, I, it's been a long time since I've seen them in, in some of the older bakeries, but there's some that have these, um, what I call lobes. It's like they're, they're great big rubber wheels, but they're not round, they're like a triangle. And so they, it's like a, um, similar to a, a positive displacement pump. They kind of grab the dough and push it down. And so they're, it's, it's it, like they're doing this. And so, but they, they don't touch. So they don't, they don't break the gluten. They're just grabbing the dough and pushing it in. Right. And so mm -hmm. th those types of feeding is also, again, gentler than it is the, the vacuum on a dough pump um, and doesn't, you know, tear the, the gluten apart. And that, that's the thing that we're trying to, to maintain. Right. I also like to add that I would love to see um, people reaching out to me with new innovations on this portion of the dough process, because I think we have not perfected it yet. Right. No, so th there's a lot of science that it's. Like, yeah, we <laughs> haven't per perfected this pro pro process yet and we haven't perfected the folding of the process uh, of, of the doughs yet. So a lot, a lot in, of equipment innovation still has to be done, you know, for for the artisan bakers. I, I, I just want to put it out there. So and that's that's pa that's part of again, as, as you've commented, you know, part of the fun in the conversation at the forum. I mean, Let's let's talk about these things and 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 find you know more input from ideas from other people and and you know like you know, Thomas and and others and, and as well. I mean, uh, it's all that sort of what to me I call it fun. It's it's that discovery. Um, and uh, real quick short story. I always remember when I, I did some serial chemistry 101 with Dr. Hosni, and uh, I remember he he uh, was asking us about the the effects of fermentation on gluten proteins. And, uh, and so, you know, I mean, I really kept my mouth shut. I was like the, the little guy and with all these people from Kellogg's and stuff like that. And, and everybody's putting up their hand and saying all these things. And, and he said, well, you're, you're all wrong. You're all wrong. We don't know. Nobody knows. <laughs> we, we're still, it's still part of the science that we're trying to fully understand right now. We've, we've learned to understand more since then. That was over 20 years ago, but still, I mean, that's, that's an example of what, you know, uh, in science, we're always trying to discover more about these things. And uh, we, and, and asking the questions helps us find more answers. Great. Thank you. I love Dr. Hosni's speeches. So, so um, happy I was in a few of them. Um, I want to address one of the comments that came through from Mohammed. Um, I think proofing time depends on temperature of dough before entering proofer and amount of yeast in recipe. Is that correct? Yes. Um, the temperature of dough, especially in artisanal breads, is so important. The final mixing temp 
um, I didn't address that, but you need to target a consistent final dough temp, uh, uh, um, dough temp coming out of the mixer to be able to com control the proofing process. So that's mm -hmm. a great point. And yes, um, it is controlled by temperature of dough and amount of yeast, but there is only this much yeast you can put in. Okay. I mean, I've, I've seen bakers try to uh, increase, you know, um, the throughput and reduce the fermentation time by increase the yeast, you know, by increasing the yeast. What, what happens when you do that, Mark? It tastes like yeast. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> it, it doesn't, doesn't, it just tastes like yeast afterwards. It, and uh, you, you, you don't get added fermentation. It doesn't really go any faster up. Uh, you know, um, the thing is the yeast is most happy in an environment sort of in the 75 to 90 degree range around there. And that's where you're going to get good productivity. Um, uh, once you start to get warmer, um, it actually slows down. Um, what I've often, you know, used to explain this with my college students is that, you know, it's just like going to the beach, you know, when it's, when it's nice and sunny and it's 75, 80, 85, 90, you know, you're, you're happy, you're comfortable. Once it gets up into the hundreds, you don't move very quick, right? I mean, you start That's to slow true. down a whole lot. Yeast right? like people. Um, and <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a bacteria that needs to be kept happy. And um, so, yes, it is critical, all of those things. Um, you, you can't come out with a, a, a 65 degree dough and then go into a 90 degree uh, um, proofer and get nothing but condensation on it because the dough is way too cold and then it'll ferment too fast on the exterior and not quick enough on the interior by the time the temperature penetrates. So it, yes, it is very important to have all those three things in balance and check. And, uh, and so you got to do your calculations. You have to understand what your, the factor, the friction factor is of your mixer and your processing as to how much it affects your, temperature on your dough so that you have the right temperature of water with ingredients and so on. Um, and of course, in the summertime, that's always a challenge in hot places, right? Um, and I've used ice charts, believe me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, it's, um, uh, so making, making uh, artisan bread at 110 degrees in Jamaica. Yeah, not ideal. Big challenge. <laughs> right, not ideal. Um, I, I think you, you really need to have a different mindset when mm -hmm. you move from um, a bun, a white bun bread product to artisan breads, you really yes. just have to have that different mindset. Yep. And if you're not open to that different mindset, then be ready to fail at a drastic scale, yep. you know, because you, you just need to understand how important fermentation and taste is. Yeah, and, you, um, you manage it. You manage your environment you as best as you it. can and you manage everything else. Yeah. Right. Okay. I want to go on into the next comment on the chat window. Um, what sort of flour is ideal for laminated doughs? And, and I think um, Thomas can chime in as, as well. Uh, what kind of flour is ideal for laminated doughs? And if we were to increase extensibility, uh, we have an automated croissant line and consistent weights poses our biggest challenge. Oh, I see a few things. All right. Anything to add, gentlemen? You, go, you guys go first. Um, I'll let Thomas take this one first. <laughs> um, well, the flour, the most important thing is don't go to high in gluten. It's, uh, you need that uh, um, a, a strong baker's flour will, will be way too tough. Um, also, the, the additional uh, ascorbic acid uh, will make it very tough to actually um, have some extensibility in there. Um, I always look at, at uh, more like an all-purpose flour uh, or, or even a mix of, uh, of two or three um, medium, uh, medium gluten flours. Um, second of all, temperature is everything with croissant lines and croissant doughs. Um, the moment you add a fat to your dough, so not not the laminating fat, but uh, but the dough into your fat, um, that will all also have have a big impact on the gluten network. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so there's a lot of lot of factors when it comes to industrial uh, croissant processing that have to be met. And uh, and um, 
uh, increasing extensibility, for instance, is is very possible with uh, uh, with lower gluten. But then again, how are you rolling out? How fast are you rolling out? Are you yeah. resting enough? Um, all those things factor in. So for for just a, I'll just take first the flour question. Don't go too high in gluten. I think uh, uh, between uh, between uh, 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 nine and twelve percent is your sweet spot. Um, and then whatever mix of flowers you have available with your suppliers uh, uh, would work uh, and watch out for ascorbic acid. Mm -hmm. Right. I, agree. I think you want to take, take a look at your ascorbic acid and put it back. Yeah. But I, I, I'm in total agreement with Thomas because um, whenever there is a, a laminated dough question, I've always seen a commonality of temperature. Like you, the temperatures are, are what's causing the yeast to react. And also if you, if, you, if you can't spit it out at a lower temperature and your temperature is higher at your final mix, then you, 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 your yeast is just gonna ferment and give you inconsistent weights. So in order to prevent that, either you lower your temperature or lower your batch size so that the front of the dough is not going to be different from the end of the dough. Like you need to process a dough, what say between how many minutes, Mark? What do you think? Uh, yeah, well, on most spiral mixers is probably going to be six to eight, something like that. Yeah, you need to, you need to process that dough be beneath eight minutes. Like mm -hmm. if you process, if, you, if, you're, if you're spinning out doughs that require 15 minutes of uh, process, it's sitting in the, in, in the bulk bowl for 15 minutes before, you know, the front and the end of the dough, that's where you're going to see the inconsistency, mm -hmm. you know? So that's, that's my input. What's yours, and, Mark? Well, oh, and, and one, one more quick thing is, is that uh, a lot of bakeries uh, mix too, uh, not long enough in, in the slow speed. Um, I think definitely for, for uh, if you're looking at the dough temperature, uh, one good thing to keep the dough temperature down is mix a little bit longer at first speed, make sure everything's hydrated and well developed before you hit that second speed where actually energy and heat is added. Yes. And, uh, very good. Um, That's a great just, point. Yeah, Back very important. Work. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and with those, you know, when you're doing your, your dough temperature calculations to not skip any of the factors. So, um, one place I've seen in croissant production is they they used a, a portion of their um, their flour. They used unbleached pastry flour, a soft wheat flour. So it was only around maybe between eight and nine percent protein, something like that, um, to help lean things out a little bit. But they also forgot to keep in mind that when they did a pre-ferment with that, they would do that well with uh, water and the yeast and, and the sugar from the dough and let that ferment for half an hour, 40 minutes before they would start the mixing. Well, fermentation generates heat as well. So as to, to Thomas's point, you have to look at all of the energy inputs so that then you may need to drop your water temperature even further and make sure that you mix on slow speed. Because with a croissant dough, a cold dough is ideal. I mean, like something in the in the high 60s is, is basically what you're looking for. And um, and a lot of uh, processors actually even refrigerate the dough and allow an overnight or a long, slow fermentation to allow the pentosans and the um, proteases to give you more extensibility in the dough as well. Um, so, you know, a homemade classic croissant dough is always fermented overnight first before the laminating starts. Um, so you, but either way, you want to have a cool dough, gives you uh, better lamination and the processing so that you don't start fermenting too soon in the process. Great. All right. The next comment from the chat box is how, what should the final temperature be of dough coming out of the mixer for artisan breads? Well, nice. and again, that goes back to the processing and fermentation afterwards. So uh, if you are, you know, processing right away, like going to dividing, rounding, and uh, uh, your, your uh, fermentation, your intermediate, and then your final uh, proof, um, you probably want something manageable in the 75 to 80 degree range. Um, but if you're doing a longer slower fermentation, you might go slightly cooler. Um, 
if you're going to do a shorter fermentation for whatever reason, then you, you probably want to be 85 to 90. So it, it really, it's understanding everything in your process that affects that. Okay, great. And if you're well, in a 110 degree bakery, you, you probably want it to be even cooler. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Peter, Peter Ellis, thank you for your um, comments. Um, and one more question from Hugo Gonzalez. What is your recommendation to have, uh, what is your recommendation for a thicker crust when bread is in the oven? Malt. <laughs> yes, malt why? will definitely help. <laughs> why why um, would malt give you a thicker crust? Uh, well, uh, thicker crust is, is a mix between, uh, between actual baking and the ingredients. So um, uh, malt uh, will give you a little bit more crispiness uh, in, your, um, in your crust. Uh, you will start the crust forming a little bit earlier in the process often uh, without using a very high temperature. And uh, that, that actually creates that little bit thicker crust if you want it. Uh, of course, it's not always desirable, uh, but the, the option is there. So um, definitely with a, with a, um, a, a malt extract, uh, which also in, includes a little bit more sugars um, and, the, and the functionality of malt will help you uh, create a little bit thicker crust, uh, a little bit earlier crust development and uh, and and the yeah, thicker crust is is uh, has a lot to do with with baking temperature and baking time. So depending on the flour you use, a heavy rye bread, it's easier to get the thicker crust uh, because it it does not color that much than, for instance, a a white sandwich loaf, which has more sugars and actually gets gets darker quicker. Um, so. Um, uh, there, there's, of course, it depends on the recipe, but I would say uh, sh uh, you can always shoot us an email, um, and uh, and uh, with your recipe, we can always do a suggestion on a product and get you a sample of that to try out. Well, but it's very I, specific on the product. Yeah, and and the malt will also help in that you you use less or no sugar in your dough to be able to feed the yeast because the malt is breaking the carbs down to feed the yeast. So you you have less browning sugars than in, in the dough as well. Um, because, you know, it's like the, um, that Italian Calabrese bread, you know, it's They always say the Calabreses are so stubborn because they break their, bake their bread so hard. Right. You know, it's like, it's a stubborn shell. Right. <laughs> um, and, um, but yeah, they, and then that way you can bake longer and you can dry out the crust without drying the interior to get that thicker, crisper crust. And longer doesn't mean like 20 minutes longer. It's you're talking like, we're talking five, 10 at the most, right? It really doesn't take much, right? All right, so we have come to the end of our presentation. Already? And uh, yeah, I know <laughs> the hour and a half just whizzed by like that because we're having fun. These are always so much fun. Um, we want to continue this discussion on the forums. So if you have more questions on today's presentation, let's bring it to the forums and let's uh, have Mark work the forums. And um, again, if you put in your email, uh, Thomas is going to reach out to you and send you the Roma box. So um, Thomas, thank you so much for joining us and showing us um, the different kind of malt application today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So um, till the next time, bakers, join us for our next Baker View. Bye. Bye.